Mr. Torres. Mr. Cowan. Here. Mr. Young. Here. So right now you have quorum of the Finance Committee. Thank you, Sheila. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay, our first opportunity for public comment. Anything online? Hold on just a second. You have the written statements in front of you, and then there, I believe there is one online. So hold on just a second. If you are online and wish to speak for a couple of public comment, please raise your hand. Robin, go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I'm getting an echo. I had to call in on my phone. Um, my name is Robin Trumper from Highland, Michigan, and I'm the Executive Director of Freedom Work Opportunities. Uh, we have a vocational program in Oakland County, and actually this year we are celebrating our 40th year. And I would like to address the issue. We received a notice on September 29th that vocational programs would not be getting an increase in our rates, and it's kind of disturbing that there was no real knowledge of this prior to the very last minute, because there was a number of discussions and even a projected rate increase that were sent out that leaded us all to believe that there would be something coming our way. Um, as you know, expenses have gone up and everything, and most of ours over the last two years have been uh, things have gone up about 25%. And I just received actually notice today that our health insurance is going to increase by another 24%. That's especially disturbing since this is one of the very few benefits we have to offer our staff. And we're now questioning how we're going to be able to do that. Um, and other than our the much deserved staff increases that we've received, we really haven't gotten any substantial funding increases from OCHN since they took over in 2018. So when they discontinued the cost reimbursement and no rate increases, this has really put the vocational programs into crisis mode and will definitely be devastating to the persons we serve. And I'd like to just say I think the resources of OCHN can be better spent um, providing support and guidance to their providers and funding that goes directly to the person served and their hands-on providers. Um, it seems like rather than hiring more legal staff to fight the issues, um, perhaps a more open dialogue with the providers, ask what we need, assist us with writing grants, um, maybe some some help could have been there for um, applying for the federal employee retention credits. Um, we now spend a lot of time doing reporting, submitting documentation, jumping through hoops to meet deadlines. And when you deal with three different PIHPs, they all have their own agenda. Their interpretations are all <laughs> expectedly differently, and it's extremely exhausting. Um, and am I honestly, in my 40 years of doing this, I cannot recall a time when the agency providers have had to band together to stay informed, distribute a much needed information, and share issues of concern. And it also seems quite frequent now that provider, this provider group has to spend their hard earned funds in order to hire legal representation to handle issues um, that we're having with OCHN. Um, think about that for a minute. OCHM receives Medicaid funds, passes them on to us providers for direct services, and then we have to hire legal services, and you have to hire attorneys to argue back and forth, all for the good of the person served and the people in the trenches and on the front lines. Might make more financial self sense to develop a working relationship and a true partnership with the providers. That's it. Thank you for your time listening to my concerns. All right, thank you for your comment. Any other from online? If anyone else wishes to make public comment online, please raise your hand. If not, I think we have one in the room. We can circle back. Okay, all right. 
Anyone in the room wish to make a comment? Yes, come on up. Fred Cummins, President of Alliance for Romilly, Yellow County. Um, I just wanted to bring your attention to uh, Michigan House Bill uh, 4893 called the MI Care Act. It was introduced June 18th, and uh, that's about it. I haven't seen any action on it, but I'm concerned about uh, the content of it. Um, it's not got some interesting aspirations, but uh, as a practical matter, I don't see it, the feasibility of actually implementing it. A lot of speculation without much substance. One of the things that seems, it appears that there are an effort to consolidate, possibly consolidate PIHPs into a single organization. They're forming a, intent to inform a quote, independent organization with an independent board of uh, members that are basically professionals selected by politicians. Uh, not a good sign, basically not really dealing with the, the frontline problems, but uh, continuing to insulate the MDHHS from the realities of the system. The consolidation appears to include community mental health uh, and physical health. So all of the uh, Medicaid physical health providers. It also intends to consolidate uh, sources of funding, including Medicare and Medicaid, into a single fund. I'm not sure how you do that. Is, uh, they have different funding mechanisms and criteria, uh, but it re requires some kind of uh, waivers by the feds to give Michigan some special treatment in terms of how things are funded. Um, also, uh, the intent to get to hire and, tr and retain better professionals, but. I don't see much in the way of uh, intent of, of funding them better or giving them better jobs, like allowing them to function as actual professionals as opposed to people who are confined to very limited budgets and what they can do and, and what they can provide in the way of, of meeting clients or recipients' services requires actual needs as opposed to what we can get by with in, in the budget. And I don't see any intention to deal with the fact that there's at least hundreds of thousands of people who need mental health services who are not receiving any because you have to be a danger to yourself or others to get services, to get access. Because in addition to all the children who not need services who have been denied, denied services or ignored for decades. Where, uh, for example, uh, also dealing with uh, early intervention, we've all heard about the Oxford shooter. Keep hearing about him. It should have been intervened long before he got to the point of shooting anybody, and that's both the fault of the school system, which said, "Go home. You're, you're causing trouble," and this organization, which was missing in action by not not being available to respond to anybody because nobody knew they were they were here to respond to anybody. All that's not changed, and this bill is addressing none of that. No. Okay. As I said, there hasn't been any actions as, as far as I can see, but I think the Democrats have been very busy overturning a lot of uh, Republican legislation over the previous administration trying to get that out of the way before they do anything real beyond that, okay, potentially addressing the mental health system. So be aware. 
you need to pay attention to 4893. We'll and pass it that on to our lobby. Spring up at some point and, and bite us all. Okay, well, duly noted. Thank you, sir. Any other comments from the room? If not, can I get a motion to approve tonight's agenda? So moved. Support. We have a motion and support. All in favor by aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, Finance Committee. Uh, item 2A is a financial update. Just wanted to um, update the board that um, we're in the process of updating our reports to accurately reflect year-end um, processes, and uh, we're meeting this week to provide time frame when the September uh, financials will be presented. But today we're still in the process of finalizing uh, some of our um, year-end processes to accurately reflect our year-end report. So that's your est estimation on the timeline or a guesstimate or anything you can kind of. Well, we are meeting this um, Saturday with our consultant to determine, and by Monday we'll have a re estimated time frame when that report will be ready. Um, okay. Any questions from the Finance Committee on? So for the full board meeting next week, what what will we have in terms of financials or expected? I like to be optimistic to think that we could possibly have it by then, but I just want to make sure after this Saturday meeting to make sure that we're good to move forward with um, the year-end numbers that we are presenting. Okay. We're hoping that they'll be ready in time for the meeting, but until we have the meeting with our consultant on Saturday, I hate to say they'll definitely be ready because we won't have an, an, a real update until after that. Okay. Any questions from committee members? Okay. So we should allow a little extra time at the board meeting just in case, whether you have the report or not, when we get to the full board meeting, there'll be more questions. Yeah. I will say for most organizations to present year-end numbers this quickly is kind of an aberration, you know, mm -hmm. not just in, in this field, but in most. Yep, yep, yep. Understood. Okay. But we've also got, um, it, it's been, as uh, you know a little bit and Patrick knows a lot, it has been a most... Uh, Challenging last eight months, so yes. that's why there's going to be um, a fair amount of curiosity when we get to the, uh, the full board. Ms. Malkaya yes. had her hand up. Thank you. Um, if the report is ready by Monday, will we get the report prior to the meeting or just in the meeting? If it's ready, we will try to get it out prior, but again, especially with my being new, I want to make sure I have time to review it and get comfortable with it before presenting any numbers to the board. Thank you. Pastor Jones. When, when you bring that report, uh, as, as our chair has mentioned, it's been a crazy year. Mm -hmm. <laughs> crazy year. Um, <clears throat> and, and, and maybe you could give some clarification on here's more about what happened, what things we're putting in place. Uh, to try to ensure, although you know, it may not be in your control, how to ensure that we don't have uh, some of the issues next year that we had this year. Um, and I'm, I'm really into projections and, you know, anticipations, okay, as best as you can. Uh, so maybe in that final, final report, uh, I know that um, at the last audit, as what does the auditors uh, see and what recommendations and so maybe that too could be included 
in your final analysis as to year end, this is what happened, and now here's what we're looking forward to. Uh, noting that next year is going to be as challenging, if not more challenging, I think that the projections, anticipations, uh, certainly ought to be considered as we run into that first quarter. Okay. Yep, I mean, our plan is to try to put as many additional internal controls in place as we can, mm -hmm. and we even this afternoon had a meeting on some of the things that we know we need to change and try to update. So we are constantly looking at that, and we will make as many changes to improve things as we can, as soon as we can. Good. Thank you. Okay. And we'll definitely keep you informed. <clears throat> Appreciate it. All right. Uh, Go ahead, Patrick. No, I was just going to mention that, you know, even in prior years, you know, there's been times where we didn't present the September financials because we know sometimes they're not complete and uh, there's a lot of things that go into year-end processes. So I did want to bring that up. Uh, yeah, no, fair, fair point. Understood. Um, but I, I think even if it's like, uh, I'll borrow some Pastor Jones terminology, you know, kind of best case, worst case scenario. So we have some, what's the floor, what's the ceiling? So, because we know the, um, you know, the, the challenges with redetermination, I, I think are, I'll say it this way, are, are, are bigger than the state anticipated mm -hmm. and, and remain that way. Even the confusion about who's in, who's automatic, who's not automatic. Um, so you guys are off the hook. NASA is on the hook for, we need to see those numbers with that report. I mean, that, that's kind of also part of the revenue stream. So, um, you know, uh, I know Pastor Jones said final analysis. We know it's far from final, but I think we need a, a pretty good handle from your professional opinions about, you know, where does it look like we ended and, you know, if the sky is rosy, this is where we're at. If the sky is stormy, this is where we're at. So. We'll do. Okay, very good. Okay. Thank, right, you thank you both. Thank you. Okay, item B, contractual obligations over 100,000. I think we've got two of those. Oh, okay, so we've got the resolution and then, but Edna gets both of them, correct? All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me. My name is Edna White. I am the HR Director for Oakland Community Health Network, and I'm here to present on two items. Uh, the first is Public Act 152. I'll give you some uh, background about uh, that particular piece of legislation and an associated resolution which our leadership team is bringing to the board uh, for approval. And then I will follow it up with some information about our staffing, employee benefits, and uh, some demographic information that I think you may find interesting. Oh, boy. That's a little small. Okay. Uh, uh, so uh, just by way of, um, you know, giving you some background information about Public Act 152, uh, this was a um, legislation that was enacted in 2011, and it took effect in 2012. The Michigan State Legislature passed the law to mandate that all public employees pay at minimum 20% of the cost of any health care benefit. I actually misspoke. The, the law technically says that the employer would not be required to pay more than 80% of the uh, health care benefits, thereby mandate, mandating at minimum a 20% cost share for employees. And um, I have to say that a particular chart uh, did not blow up <laughs> quite well enough for me to see the detail here, so I'm going to have to refer uh, to my cheat sheet here. All right, so the Act provides for the implementation of one of two mandates relative to the dollar amounts public employees in the state of Michigan will pay for health insurance. So an uh, employer can meet this requirement by either having a flat dollar amount that maxes out the amount that the employer will pay for health benefits 
or a percentage. And so what you're seeing below is uh, some information and research that was uh, conducted by the Gallagher Company. And the chart just shows some historical information going back to 2019 about what those uh, hard cap dollar amounts were or the um, employee contributions. And what it's showing is that um, the hard cap amount has increased or decreased depending on what the economic conditions in the state has been. And it shows the data for uh, three different levels of coverage. So you're talking about uh, what these dollar amounts have looked like uh, for singles, uh, people carrying uh, coverage for themselves and one other individual, or for family coverage. So uh, by way of example, if you're looking at the data for 2023, It's stating that a public employer could not pay more than $7,399.47 for a health care premium for a single person, $15,474.60 for two-person coverage, or $20,180.43 for family coverage. And um, if there's any amount in excess of that, then the entire cost will be borne by the employee. So that is the uh, current picture of what the requirements look like under uh, Public Act 152. Next slide, please. So as a leadership team here at Oakland uh, Community Health Network, um, the current benefits designs and exemptions from the requirements of Public Act 152 allows our organization to compete in a highly competitive market for qualified staff to plan and implement the critical programs with effective monitoring to ensure the best outcomes for persons served by the Oakland Community Health Network. So uh, when we see these presentations that are put forth by teams across the organization, Uh, The board has been made aware of uh, many of the new initiatives that uh, we have, um, you know, spent time on over the course of the last several years. So the School Mental Health Navigator Program, our well-received co-responder clinician uh, program, uh, the work that we've done with CCBHCs, the work that we've done with implementing uh, behavioral health homes for SUD, Uh, behavioral health and uh, other populations served. So we have really grown as an organization and we've been competing with uh, similar organizations, PIHPs, CMHSPs, provider organizations, private sector organizations to bring in people who can perform these uh, responsibilities. Uh, Next slide, please. So um, we have prepared the following statement so that the board can understand our position as it relates to Public Act uh, 152. We seek to offer competitive pay and benefits to our staff in order to attract and retain talented individuals whose knowledge, skills, ability, and passion contribute directly to our organizational goals. We've managed our benefit structure in ways that are competitive and cost conscious. We do a lot of work to monitor our health plan costs and utilization. We've met with our benefit plan providers no less than four times this year where we receive utilization data. They talk about trends. They talk about what's happening in the healthcare marketplace. They provide recommendations uh, to our leadership team so that we can make decisions that are cost effective, that allow us to stay within our administrative budget and that we feel can move the needle in bringing people to OCHN to work. And we do have internal processes in place to bid out our plans for medical, prescription, dental, and vision services. Again, we, we've met with them no less than four times, and about three times in the last couple of months, in fact. Um, we, we have documentation to show that we can support the current plan through cost sharing increases while staying within our administrative budget. When I say cost share increases, uh, that means cost share to our staff. Uh, The legislative mandate 
constrains management's flexibility to structural total compensation packages that attract the highest quality employees who contribute to the benefits of our organization and the community at large. We are confident that we are exercising appropriate judgment and setting our compensation and benefit structure in a manner that helps us attract and retain the right people to guide this organization through this challenging and changing environment. Next slide. So today we respectfully ask that you support our autonomy and management decisions by approving the attached resolution to exempt OCHN from the mandates of Public Act 152. Passage of an exemption resolution will permit our organization to proceed with schedule open enrollment based on the certainty of the plans and pricings that were in effect during the planning period. Uh, with the approval, uh, just for your information, um, I ran uh, some new calculations and the cost share to our employees would be 15.6% if the current plan is approved. So our next steps in our uh, benefit plan, um, review official plan renewal with Assured Partners. You're going to see some more information about Assured Partners on the next presentation that I have, but we have contracted with them to serve as our benefits management agency, and they are the ones who do the bidding out on our behalf and help us to structure our contracts and negotiate prices. Uh, propose an increase to an employee cost share structure. We've already done that as a leadership team. Uh, prepare the open enrollment for the 2024 plan year, which is uh, what we are uh, working on right now. And um, we will be moving forward once we have the new contract with Blue Cross offset for uh, administrative approval. And what we always do every year is to monitor costs and utilization to develop strategy for the following year. You did receive a copy of the resolution as part of your uh, board packet. I have that, but before uh, we review the re resolution, I'd like to know if the board has any immediate questions. Uh, Question or comment. So, as I understand this from having dealt with this in the past, this is just to give uh, management in determining benefits some flexibility without the restraints of the uh, legislation. That is correct, and it must meet board approval before management right. can have that flexibility. Right, because the legislation provides we have to vote on it. So, and that's been the tradition in the past that it's been approved. Yes, since okay. uh, 2012. Uh, there is a, a, a structural provision that allows OCHN to do this based on our historical relationship with the county when we used to be part of the county, mm -hmm. and the county has supported an opt-out resolution for their staff every year since 2012 as well. Right. So if we have the recommendation today of finance and then the vote by the full board next Tuesday, you'll have adequate time to uh, get the plans out to all the... Uh, employees? That is correct. Okay. Thank you. I know you're running it a little close to the vest. We talked about that in the executive committee meeting, but... Yes, and um, just for um, for those uh, not on the executive committee, um, we don't enjoy making these presentations in the month of December. If I could do it in September or August, I would do it every year. Right. However, we are at the... Um, uh, we, we have to wait until we get the quotes and Blue Cross has been very slow to uh, release the quotes. We didn't get them this year until September. Right, right. So we're not behind because we were, we're doing our job. It was more the providers were not, uh, the, the health care providers were not uh, getting us the information back as fast so you could assemble the data for a comprehensive benefit package. Okay, thank you very much. John Paul. Every single year, yes, we do. Mm -hmm. um, but what, percent, <clears throat> what percentage are the employees currently cost sharing? Um, you know, that's a, a good question. I've structured the um, information to have the 15.6% um, uh, 
information, and I wanted to have that ready for you today. I didn't. I will make sure I have it for the next meeting. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Do you know offhand if it's more or less? I think it's slightly less. Well, what we're doing right now is raising the cost for our employees. Uh, there's more information about that on the next presentation. Okay. So you need us to move the, for the resolution forward? Uh, yes, we would need approval on the uh, resolution. If you want, I can go through the other presentation and we can come back to this. I don't know if that's allowable under the terms of the let's, agenda. Let's do it now. Then we can come because that's just other detail. So I need a motion from someone on the Finance Committee in support. So moved. Support. We have a motion and we have support. I'm using one makes motions. All right, Sheila, do we need roll call? Yes. Pastor Jones? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Motion carries? Thank you. All right, let's proceed with part two of the presentation. All right. Uh, this um, second presentation is the OCH and employee data compensation and benefits summary. And as part of the request for the opt-out, I wanted to give the board a chance to uh, review some um, information that we have about, you know, just the background on our current staffing situation, some historical information, some information about the content of our benefits as well. So we'll go ahead and get started. Oh, I should preface this. Uh, you're going to see different staffing numbers depending on the snapshot in time that the information was captured. So some of the information will be uh, current um, as of last week when I did a, a staff capture based on headcount. Uh, you'll see some information from October because I wanted to compare fiscal year to fiscal year. And some of the information will be current as of 8-31-2023 because that was the utilization uh, data that was presented to us as we made decisions about how to move forward with the benefit plans. So I wanted to kind of head that question off. So let's get started. Uh, OCHN administration and staffing today. As of Monday of last week, we were able to welcome one new employee to the organization for a total head count of 259 staff. That encompasses 248 full-time employees, seven part-time employees, of the part-time employees, four were interns or co-op students. Uh, we've expanded our community presence with enhanced programming and services. These are reviewed just a moment ago when I talked about the programming related to the CCDHC, SUD Health Homes, our co-responder uh, initiatives, other programs in the Justice Initiatives team. We have a cadre of staff all throughout the county working in court locations, so we're very pleased with that. Uh, the mental health navigator um, positions that we have, uh, crisis services um, that are being managed by OCHN as well. Um, as I have mentioned before, staffing has been impacted by um, the staffing crisis and the competitive job market, which I talked about earlier. All right, so this information that you're looking at is current as of 10-1-2023, uh, and I wanted to provide a comparison of where we are um, last fiscal year and the fiscal year that just started. So last fiscal year, we were looking at a head count of 214 staff, and um, as of 10-1 of this year, it was 253. Uh, we had 66 new hires. Of the people who left the organization, um, when we look at voluntary separations, we're looking at a headcount of 19, and that, that's a turnover rate of 8.14%. Uh, the turnover data does not include information about the students because they were planned to be temporary staff anyway. And we didn't want that to throw off the numbers. I have some uh, contextual information about employee turnover, which remains a challenging concern statewide. I was able to uh, pull a report from the Michigan Health Council, 
and um, it looks at um, staffing concerns in healthcare across the state. And I specifically pulled out information about human service workers. So what the data that you're looking for was in 2022, they talk about the number of job vacancies that were available under these different categories. And as you can see, there were more job open, uh, more jobs that were open in 2023 than in 2022. Uh, we're looking at the uh, different change rates there and uh, the turnover rate that the study was able to um, um, determine based on the people who left the field. So it's not just uh, open positions, it's people who you know, completely left the field or other positions that may have opened up as well. So I wanted to provide that information for context so that you can compare it to the turnover information that was provided for OCHN. Uh, the next uh, slide uh, provides information about uh, some of the information that we got from employees during exit interviews as to why they chose to pursue opportunities outside of OCHN. Increased flexibility for remote work opportunities. We heard that quite a bit. Uh, others left because they wanted higher compensation. And quite a few left for promotional opportunities. I must say that when we look out over the last several years, many of the people that did leave OCHN have become leaders, not just um, within our agency, because we certainly support promotions within our agency, but across the entire human service community in the state of Michigan, you know, there's a footprint from OCHN. Um, the next a set of information is on staff demographics. So we thought you might find this uh, uh, information useful. We do have information on our website and we have this statement that's included um, on our recruitment site and in every job description for OCHN. We promote a work environment that encourages innovation and accountability while providing many opportunities for professional development. OCHN is committed to building a diverse team and fostering an inclusive and equitable culture. We are proud to be an equal employer, opportunity employer that embraces and encourages our employees' differences. This is includes but is not limited to ability, age, color, family type, gender expression and identity, individual expression, medical conditions, national origin, pregnancy, race, religion, sexual orientation, veteran status, and all other diverse and wonderful characteristics. This statement was drafted and supported by our DEI committee. Uh, the next slide provides um, information on demographic data. Um, you can see the information there, but I'll go ahead and uh, speak to it for the uh, benefit of those who are tuning in. Um, at the time that this was uh, taken, we had a headcount of 250 employees, and we were looking at um, 54 males, 196 females, so you can see uh, the female population greatly outnumbers the male population. As far as uh, race and ethnicity, uh, we're looking at 56% who identified as white. Uh, by the way, um, all of the information on race and ethnicity is based on self-reported data. So um, some people chose to report, some people reported in you know more than one category. You know, so if things aren't adding up to be 100%, that's why. Uh, so uh, we're looking at a population of 56% uh, white employees, 25.2% who identify as black or African American, 2% uh, identifying as Hispanic or Latino, 3.6% Asian, 0.4% okay. American Indian or Alaska Native, two or more races, um, we have 2% who reported, and 10.8% chose to not report. Another important demographic factor that's showing up quite a bit in management uh, practice is looking at uh, the generations across the workforce. 
Um, so we can see that uh, based on the generational breakdown, we're looking at baby boomers, 13.6% of our employee population, um, the Gen X population, 40.4%, uh, Gen Z, 4.8%, and 41.2% are represented by millennials, which is our largest section of our workforce. And that same report that I cited earlier from the Michigan Health Council, uh, I won't go into each item. Um, uh, this is on the next slide. I won't go into each item, but for comparison purposes, uh, they were able to pull this demographic data for other um, human service organizations across the state of Michigan. I'm going to take a break right now and see if I can answer any questions that the board may have about the section of data that has just been presented to you. Well, Kaya, you have a question? Um, Edna, thank you for your report. Mm -hmm. um, they have a category, they are using a category of community health worker. Does that include the other peers or is that just that one category? It's a broad category. If they couldn't uh, place it as a licensed clinician or social worker or something like that, they called it community health workers. The report that I pulled did not necessarily specify peer workers. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Hey, Pastor Jones. Uh, I'd like to get uh, clarification. I'm, I'm looking at this. The uh, Hispanic rate, and, and when we look at that, uh, the number, uh, what is it? It says maybe five. Five. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and it raised a little bit of alarm with me in relation um, to our reach out to not only offer services to that Hispanic and Latino group. This this because of the fact that we have such a limited number of Hispanics working to be able to communicate, talk to, what have you, and encourage. I'm wondering, um, and you may not be able to answer that question, maybe if there's someone else, but I'm, I'm, I'm a little concerned with the number, okay, that uh, if the total uh, Hispanic population is greater than what we see here. Okay, uh, and so um, I, I think it has a uh, impact on serviceability, who we're serving, what the image is of OCHN, especially as it comes back to diversity, equity, and inclusion. To have such a small number of Hispanic and Latino population. And so the, the question it, it is in the hiring or the promotion, what efforts are made that would help us to pull more in? And I'm sure you're probably looking at that, but what, what would be the effort in pulling uh, more Hispanics in, which would increase it, have a snowball effect, I guess is what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. So maybe you can answer that. And, and especially, um, if I look at, at, at Pontiac with, uh, what, maybe 32% Hispanic, uh, Rochester, okay, and I was talking to my friend here, uh, <laughs> what about that same percentage, especially along Rochester Road and what have you, Auburn Hills, um, and I was trying to make sure that we reach those pockets, reach those pockets, I'm not sure if five people can get to all of them. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if there's an answer. Yeah, so um, I actually did this report a couple of years ago, and sadly I had to report that that number was two individuals. So this is a historic challenge that we've faced. We have broadened our network of agencies that we uh, recruit from, the different services that we use, um, providers and partner organizations that we reach out to that would have some outreach into the Hispanic community. We've posted positions where we have specifically requested that uh, the ability to speak Spanish is a preferred 
um, uh, qualification. Certainly that doesn't mean that it would be an, a Hispanic individual um, because people have fluency in language outside of their own ethnicity. But it is a, a, a challenging problem that we've worked on and we've talked about it internally about how to expand that. I see I have a partner from the leadership yeah. team. And, 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 you know, with, with De Deborah Ehrman and uh, Sonia Acosta, uh, with the organization that they have, which, uh, Santo, what is it called? El Centro. El Centro. Cultural, Cultural, okay. Um, you know, I, I don't know, maybe it's, it's using them as a source, maybe you still are, but saying, hey, what we see does not represent what we're all trying to do and the effort that they're trying to do as well in the training of Hispanics and the Latino community. Uh, I don't know if uh, there's something we can do. Mr. DEI. Hi, good evening. Um, good evening. Bernard Hooper, uh, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Officer. So what I would like to point out is that um, what is being presented is the employee demographic data for the roughly 250 employees who work within the organization, which is very different from the mix of providers within the provider network. Mm -hmm. um, and our intention with diversity, equity, inclusion, and access um, is to provide uh, an inclusive community within the organization that allows for and accommodates individuals of all kinds, ethnicities, those with different abilities, et cetera. However, um, we do not have a specific hiring target, um, and that is not something that is currently permissible under the law, um, or at least it is not clear that it is. Mm -hmm. However, we do have providers that cover on a culturally competent basis the, the cultures that are found within our community. Um, this question has been asked by other members of the board in previous uh, conversations about uh, our cultural diversity within the community. Um, spe specifically, the former chairman of the board uh, directed that question to me uh, previously. Uh, and as you, you've noted, a number of different providers that we have in the Pontiac area who do encompass uh, the populations that you're referring to. So. Um, Ideally our, ideally, our population here would reflect all of the individuals that we serve in some way. However, it would not necessarily be precisely aligned with the population by percentage. Um, and so we, we are not using any... Um, any tools that would be deemed to be discriminatory nor providing preference with respect to the hiring of anyone uh, in order to balance um, what we have now as our employee network. Uh, understanding that uh, there may not be a, a target that you can use, okay, that's legal or what have you, but like when, when you sit down and you say, you know, we really want to make sure that we look like we look like, okay, um, which then gives us what, what is a superficial uh, target that we can look at and say, uh, I don't think that out of 259 people, mm -hmm. five. it just doesn't, doesn't calculate, okay. I, I would have the same, you know, issue if, if we'd said 259 people and five African Americans, okay? The question has to be, what do we want to look like? And I, I, it, that number just jumps out at us, especially with the number of Hispanics and Latinos that we have and are trying to reach that population for services and the providers that we have uh, to do that, so. Thank and I know you. you're saying, and, and I really appreciate what you're doing, and I know you're saying, hey, you know, we're challenged at that, and we're trying to reach out to that, and what have you. Um, it just seems to be uh, maybe a target area. Certainly. I would also add in response to your question, it is likely and possible 
that some of those people who chose not to report could potentially be included in that right. Right. Uh, demographic as well. But certainly your point is taken. Um, thank you so much. <laughs> I think everything else looks good. Thank you so much. Okay. John Paul. Comment. So, yeah, I raised the same issue uh, last year as well when I looked at the numbers. So I appreciate you, Pastor Jones, for bringing that to the attention because last year it was a tenth of a percent better than it is this year. But I'm assuming that's because we have more employees, but it's still the same number. But um, I, I agree. It's um, you know, we're looking at Oakland County, and the Hispanic population in Oakland County is much higher than 2%. So I think uh, even though our providers may have, um, we're looking at, you know, in the position, well, in leadership here, right, with community mental health, being in community mental health, uh, part of uh, uh, the organization, Oakland County Health Network, um, having that representation there. And I, I want us to be careful about language because, you know, just somebody, um, they shouldn't be dismissed because they don't speak Spanish, right? We have translators. We have other means of, of reaching out to the Latino community. Um, we can hire, you know, communications uh, that, that can translate things for us. I think what's most important is the cultural piece um, so that individuals, you know, they, they often look at a person, and if they look similar to them, they open right up, mm -hmm. right? And I think that that's a huge piece, and they bring with them culture, so if somebody on, in, within, the, within the organization doesn't identify as Hispanic, Latino, but could be, well, they wouldn't have the cultural piece, though, I would guess, because they're not identifying as Hispanic or Latino. So I think what we want to do is, is, is you know, really focus on, um, even though we can't uh, do it you know, legally and say, hey, you, know, you get the job because, obviously, but um, perhaps outreach, um, to the Hispanic Latino community connections with some of the individuals. Um, Pastor Jones mentioned all leaders in the Hispanic community, but um, you know I appreciate the efforts and that we have a, a you know diversity, equity, inclusion, you know uh, motto, and that we move forward with it. But you know I, I said this pretty much brought up the same thing that Pastor Jones brought up today uh, last year as well. That um, I would like to see that number higher because it is. It is very low. Uh, and then I had a, uh, just a question about um, the employee turnover. The, uh, one of the things that was cited was increased uh, flexibility for remote work opportunities. So is that people who they want to be completely remote? Because we're, we're hybrid pretty much, aren't we? Right. Our current structure is we ask that um, employees who are not scheduled to work a, a community-based type job where we expect them to be out in the community 100% of the time. So primarily for office workers, we are asking that they be in the office two days a week and the, uh, they can work the other three days of the week remotely. But there are individuals who, for their own personal reasons, you know, would like to work an opportunity where they can be remote 100% of the time. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, any other questions so far on this? Um, you know, we wanted to share the data. It is what it is right now, but that d will not deter us from uh, looking to improve those numbers. Uh, but we wanted you to be able to uh, see the state of play right now. Okay. All right, so we'll move on to health benefits planning for 2024. So when we look at the number of people participating in our plan, we had approximately 250 total head count. Um, and as of 831, which is when we uh, had our uh, meeting with the benefits administration uh, consultants, they informed us that 205 employees were participating in our plan. So the eligibility would be for uh, full-time benefits eligible folks. So 205 chose to participate, and that represents 456 total lives covered. So this would be uh, dependents, spouses uh, eligible for coverage as well. The breakdown would be 88 of the 205 were single, 45 had two-person coverage, 
and 72 chose family coverage. When we offer benefits for our employees, we offer a choice. We have a Blue Cross PPO plan, a Blue Cross HMO plan with Blue Care Network. We give folks the option to opt out of our coverage if they have coverage available through, you know, a historical employer or through a spouse coverage. Uh, we have a health reimbursement account that covers the deductible and coinsurance. So that's a standalone item that we have. And uh, we cover our employees for prescriptions through a standalone provider, EHIM. They're local. They have an office in Southfield, and we've been working with them uh, for several years for our prescription coverage. We offer Blue Cross for dental and vision, and uh, we currently work with Lincoln Financial Group to support life, accidental death, and dismemberment, short- and long-term disability. Hmm. I had a nice graphic for uh, Assured Partners, and it disappeared. But uh, We work with Assured Partners. They have a local office in Wyandotte. They do employee benefits management, and they've been in um, place for over 40 years. Uh, they offer customized plan solutions for their clients. Uh, they help us with enrollment support and troubleshooting, which I must say, as uh, the lead of the HR team, we really appreciate because it's very difficult to handle um, inquiries for 456 covered individuals on top of everything else that we have to do. So we do uh, a personal touch. If people reach out directly to us, we'll make every effort to assist them with any uh, support that they need relative to the benefits plans, but that's um, another service that we're paying Assured Partners for. They do offer open enrollment support, preparing the presentations, getting people enrolled, which we appreciate. And they do take care of the annual bids to local insurance provider market on our behalf. They come back with quotes. We meet twice a year to go over utilization data. So early in the plan year, around May or June, they'll meet with us. The data is usually pretty early, but at least they want to give us an idea of how our money is being spent and what services are being covered. And again, um, we met with them in September so that they could give us utilization data through the month of August. They provide us with projections on what costs would look like if things were to stay the same way or if we were to implement any changes, and they provide thoughtful insights and analysis. So for the 2020 plan year, uh, we don't plan to make any changes to the structure of the plans that we have. Uh, the HMO has a more defined network than the PPOs. So with the HMO, you would be required to select a primary care physician, and he or she would be responsible for managing your day-to-day -day care. You would need to get a referral if you needed to see a specialist. The cost of the premium for that plan is lower. For the PPO, there is an expanded network, so you get to choose any provider in the Blue Cross uh, PPO network. Um, the uh, office visit, you know, co-pays you know, uh, would be slightly higher, and the employee premiums and the premium to the organization is higher as well. I mentioned the health reimbursement account. OCHN funds the coverage for in-network deductibles and coinsurance, of, and we monitor what that cost looks like. It's subject to great variability. Some years you may um, have folks who uh, don't utilize the plan very much at all. So, for example, in 2020, during the COVID year, utilization went way down. And by having this self-funded health reimbursement account, we're able to purchase a less costly premium with Blue Cross. So we're partially self-funded, partially fully funded with Blue Cross. And in the years when the utilization is down, you can realize some significant savings. But other years, you never know when somebody's going to have a significant health event. 
Uh, we do have a, um, with the policies that we have, there is stop loss, so we won't be paying infinite dollars. Uh, but um, we have found that the health reimbursement account has really been helpful in allowing us to purchase a lower premium plan. And again, with the prescription drug plan, it's standalone with EHIM, the pharmacy benefit manager in Southfield. And we have a multi-tier plan. So um, employees can save money by purchasing generics, but once you get outside of generics, um, there's a preferred formulary um, and uh, a non-preferred formulary. So depending on the type of medication that the employee is purchasing, uh, they'll have higher cost share. I wanted to give you some historical information about the individuals covered uh, under our plan. So going back to 2019, you can see at the time um, we had 172 employees covered and uh, 423 covered lives. And uh, you, know, you can see what those numbers have been for each of the years. For 2023, 456. I said uh, 205, that was pulled because the data was updated. We had 205 covered employees and 456. So um, update on that data. But you can see what that information has looked like over the course of the last few years. The next slide shows the cost share structure going into the 2024 plan year. So for individuals who have the HMO um, for 2023, you'll see that um, for the single, every two weeks, we're looking at $50, $75 for two-person coverage, $100 for family coverage, and we're looking at implementing a cost increase so that uh, the single coverage will go up by $5, two-person coverage $12, and family coverage $15 every two weeks. For the PPO, each one of those different cost levels has been doubled because the premium is higher for the PPO. Okay, the next slide um, is specific information about what the healthcare expenses have looked like for OCHN. And I'm going back to 2019, and each one of those expenses is broken down into how much we paid for the premium. Uh, how much we have spent on the health reimbursement account, and uh, how much we spent on prescriptions. So I made the comment earlier that in 2020, our expenses went down because there weren't as many people visiting uh, the doctor um, for um, elective health care expenses. Uh, however, that number did uh, shoot up considerably. Part of the number that you're looking at where you're seeing these cost increases is attributed to the increase in headcount. And in some cases, um, especially in 2022, in addition to the increased headcount, people went back and started getting the services that they had neglected during the height of the pandemic. So you're also seeing some projected expenses from uh, 2023 based on the data that the um, shared partners provided to us in August, um, well, based on the numbers through the month of August. Uh, the next uh, slide is a survey that we did with our staff, um, and we got feedback from the staff regarding how they feel about the benefits. So these were two questions that were presented by the Great Places to Work organizations, so we did not write these questions. However, um, of the 66 questions that were posed, these two specific ones related to benefits shows um, the amount of people who agreed with the uh, two statements. We have special and unique benefits here, 93% responded positively, and people are encouraged to balance their work life and their personal life, and that rate came in at 92%. Um, compensation survey data found that OCHN employee benefits to be highly competitive within the local labor market. So I'm going to stop there and see if we have another round of questions. Yep, that has a question. Go 
Um, when you talk about the percentage of employees that opt out, those that opt out, are they compensated for opting out? They are. Um, they're compensated depending on whether they're single, two-person, or family at the rate of the PPO because we recognize that even though we're giving them, you know, an opt-out contribution, it's saving us money from having to cover them or their family members. Good. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I'm going to go back. I, I tell you, uh, I was excited about these numbers, okay? Um, one, when I looked at the coverage of individuals from 20, uh, 2019 to 2023, and I think the number of uh, employee headcounts increased by 17%, those numbers are there about. i use some Gucci Fox numbers, a little plus or minus. And uh, the total coverage uh, five percent more, so you know, good, and and I equated that to the uh, workplace piece of ninety three percent and ninety two percent, and um, I'm going to ask, with us trying, uh, with the head count, we, the head count we lost wasn't too bad, okay, but I'm wondering how do we, um, how do we promote that because. It, 93%, 92% employees are very happy with what we're doing and what have you, which means this is a pretty good place to work, okay? Uh, benefits are there and what have you. And I, I know the numbers about the flexibility that people may not want to work, uh, want to be in the office and all of that, but pretty good stuff, pretty good stuff. So um, I don't know how you spread that. I'm sure the employees, I, I hope our employees know it, but um, reaching out and saying, look, look at the benefits of being here. How do you cascade that to the public? Um, among the goals that the HR team has for this fiscal year is to have that partnership with our communications team so that we can make sure we're getting the word out appropriately either on our uh, recruitment website. We also maintain external of sites with Indeed, ZipRecruiter, and other um, recruitment platforms, and uh, through social media. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, on this uh, um, package, we also had the resolution opt out, but we went over that already. Okay. So, any other questions? that I can answer for you or anything you'd like to see when I uh, come back for next week's, is it, yeah, next week's board meeting? No, I think we're good. All right. Well, thank you very much. I know that I owe you that uh, information, Miss um, Woodruff, about the current cost share. I'll make sure I have that information. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everyone. Okay, thank you. Very good. Yeah, I don't know. We we took care of the motion early before we. All right, we'll turn it over to policy. Kyle Glasgow. <clears throat> Good evening. Thanks for having me here. Uh, my name is Kyle Glasgow. I'm the Director of Access and Crisis at OCHN. I want to talk today about the Youth and Family Care Connection, which is the newest part of our crisis continuum here in Oakland County. Next slide. So this is the entrance. Uh, for those of you familiar with the RCC, it is on the lower level of the RCC, uh, just off Hospital Drive. Next slide. This is the lower floor, which serves as our pre-admission screening unit, uh, as well as our walk-in crisis unit, and I'll talk a little bit about all those services in a little bit. 
Next slide. This is the upper floor. This is the children's crisis care unit. Uh, this is a secured unit that um, children can go to once they get screened, and I'll talk a little bit about that process in a little bit. Next slide. Uh, this is more pictures of it. We're trying to go for uh, less of an institutional look and more of a warm and welcoming look. So there's uh, decorations on the walls and um, living room type furniture. Next slide. Uh, there are eight bedrooms. Everybody gets a private bedroom and a private bath. Uh, everything is secured. It's anti-ligature and safety uh, so that um, people are as safe as possible. Uh, and there's one bed per room. Next slide. So this came out of a grant um, that we applied to from SAMHSA, and the grant had goals in order to qualify for it. And so the grant goals that we had were to provide 1,200 non-duplicative children evidence-based mental health-related services and to train 16 people in mental health-related practices or activities that are consistent with the goals of the grant. Uh, the outcome was is uh, we served 1,300 non-duplicated children and we trained 46 uh, people in mental health-related practices. Mm -hmm. So we exceeded the goals in that part. Next slide. So, excuse me. So this all came about because um, children were being boarded in EDs. Uh, as most of you, I think, probably know, uh, we're in an effort to relieve the pressure on the EDs and provide some treatment for kids who are in crisis. Uh, OCHN applied for and received a grant from SAMHSA. It was a two-year grant, uh, $5 million, uh, $2.5 million a year. This enabled us to work with our partner, New Oakland Family Centers, uh, to staff and provide services to children in Oakland County. Uh, when we designed this, it was based on uh, a white paper from the state of Michigan who recently passed legislation to allow for the creation of crisis stabilization units. Uh, that The rules are not finalized yet, so the Children's Crisis Care Unit is not a crisis stabilization unit. However, we did design it with those guidelines in mind, as well as the guidelines of SAMHSA, with the idea being when the state finalizes the rules, we'll be able to apply for and receive uh, accreditation for the crisis stabilization unit. Uh, next slide. So the, the goals for this are really, as I talked about, we want uh, community access for mental health and triage for children. Uh, we also wanted a separate uh, crisis unit from Common Ground that specifically works with children and their families. Uh, and so for kids 17 and under. So the crisis care unit, and again, this is based off the crisis stabilization guidelines. Uh, children can stay up to 72 hours uh, once they receive a screening and based on capacity and acuity of the unit. Uh, all youth uh, 17 and under in Oakland County can receive YFCC services. That's the, the screening, the walking crisis, and the children's crisis care unit. And this is regardless of insurance. Next slide. So due to COVID, we could not open all at once. So we opened in phases. Uh, we, had to, we had to start providing services in January, even though the building wasn't established yet because our grant with SAMHSA required it. So we asked New Oakland to go into the emergency departments and screen children in the emergency departments for inpatient uh, with the hopes of diversion. And so they did that until uh, December of that year where we were able to open the lower level, which is the pre-admission screening and crisis walk-in unit. Uh, and then the last phase was in a few months later in February, where we had the addition of the secure children's crisis care unit. Next slide. <clears throat> so as I said, it, it's a walk-in unit on the bottom floor and they'll see a master's level clinician. Uh, they'll be provided an assessment to determine what's their best level of care, what's the next course of action for the child and the family. Uh, they'll either be provided with a crisis intervention and a, and a plan and go home at that point. They may be assessed for a higher level of care, which could include inpatient, partial hospitalization, or the children's crisis care unit, or crisis residential, uh, or mobile crisis. Next slide. 
So when they go to the second floor, if they go into the walk-in and it's determined that they would benefit from stabilization services, they'll go to the second floor. And there they'll receive a psychiatric evaluation. They'll see a nurse. Uh, they'll have medication management if the psychiatrist feels it's necessary. There's individual and group psychotherapy, and there's activities to keep the kids involved during the day. Uh, and then the last part of this, and uh, once they get on the unit, they start coordinating with other resources. So if they have a provider, they'll bring in the provider of psychiatric services and, into the plan and work out uh, what's the best discharge plan for the person in order to get them resources in the community. Next slide. So again, this all takes place within what we call a level of care. Uh, this could be you know, like the least level of care would be, um, you know, they walk in, they get a crisis intervention, they're able to go home that day, and the highest one would be uh, inpatient hospitalization. And so the, the goal is for the assessment is to find the appropriate level of care for the child so that they receive the best service in the least restrictive manner. Um, there are times when kids go up to the second floor and um, require inpatient hospitalization because uh, the acuity was such they could not be managed on the care unit. Next slide. So we'll talk a little bit about what it's not. So it's, it is not for physical health care. So children and their families who have physical health needs uh, should call 911 or go to the nearest emergency department. There are nurses and some medical um, ability on site, but it is not an emergency department in any stretch. Um, and it's also not a replacement for inpatient psychiatric. The grant has now ended. Uh, what we do, these are essentially our goals as we established it, and that is to expand healthcare, uh, behavioral health services for families in crisis. As we identified that as a need, uh, we wanted to reduce the extended uh, ED department stays because that was uh, troubling. Uh, and also to offer psychiatric interventions that could potentially avoid an in inpatient hospitalization. Um, providing, again, that appropriate level of care um, for the child. Next slide. 
So some data, and just a word about data as we go through all of this. Um, because it was a staggered opening and COVID happened, we don't have a full year of data where we had all three sections open and going. So this is at this point in time. Uh, at this point in time, at the end of fiscal year 2023, uh, they'd served 1,501 children. Uh, this would include the telephonic services in the ED, the walk-in crisis, and the crisis care unit. The average number of walk-ins to the uh, the crisis care unit, or I'm sorry, to the pre-admission screening uh, walk-in crisis stabilization unit is 70 a month. So those are folks that come in and get screened. Uh, and then the average number of children that are in the CCU is about 20 per month. But again, it's kind of a rotating uh, census. The average length of stay on the unit is about 3.5 days. That's more than 72 hours. Uh, and that's because in order to discharge a child, we want to make sure that they're going to a safe ending destination. And so sometimes that could take a little more effort. Uh, next slide. So again, this is preliminary outcome. Uh, but we're looking at uh, shaving off about 1.3 days from the stay in the EDs for children. Uh, we're going to keep monitoring this and, and look at the data a little closer to make sure that we're still moving in that direction. Next slide. Uh, this is the crisis care unit diversion rate. So there are several discharge places that children can go according to their need. Uh, there's partial hospitalization. Uh, there's the community. Uh, and then you'll see uh, CRU and inpatient all right, 3%, so we're, again, we're trying to avoid utilization of inpatient services if the child can tolerate it. Um, next slide. Okay, and the location, again, is in the Resource and Crisis Center. That's in the county complex at 1200 North Telegraph. Uh, it's building 32E. You can get to it off uh, Hospital Drive, and it's the lower level uh, entrance for the children. The upper level entrance is for Common Ground, our Access Center, and the RISE Center. Uh, any questions, comments, concerns? Yep. Ms. Cool. First, I just want to share my gratitude. I'm a mental health provider in the area, and unfortunately, I have had to refer some youth and their families to Common Ground because of a crisis, but fortunately, they were given the services that they needed, so I just am so, so grateful that we have this new center along with the Common Ground, you know, Center for Adults. Um, I do want to ask, so I see the phone number here. I have been giving out the 800... I think 231-1127 phone number, which was for the Common Ground um, crisis unit. So should I be giving out the 877 phone number instead? Is that the 247? Um, no, that's to connect with New Oakland directly. Oh, okay. So that you, can, you can't really go wrong if you give the Common Ground yeah. number because okay. it will be rooted to people that can provide a transfer. Okay, perfect. Um, I'm trying to think. I thought I had another question. No, I don't think I. Thank you. Miss Newman, thank you. Thank you for your report. Um, the, I have a couple questions. In the grant goals, it talks about people that were being trained. Are those people OCHN staff or people from the community, or who are they? Uh, those are folks that are from New Oakland Family Centers, so the people that staff the unit and uh, the screening. And what was my last question? I have to remember. Thank you. Mr. Torres. Um, you said the, the grant did expire, correct? Okay. Correct. So was it issued again, or is it just done? Uh, no, it's done. We did apply for what they call a no-cost extension. However, we met our goals, so they decided uh, not to grant that extension. Okay. Oh, so we asked for an extension because we didn't spend the full amount? Correct. Okay, but they didn't grant it. They did not. Okay. And I guess that's my question. Thank you. Pastor Jones? Uh, I'd like to extend on that because I was going to ask the same question in relation to the grant. 
uh, since you have reapplied, what are the uh, potential for us to it to be renewed and, and for us to get the extended amount? Uh, yeah, unfortunately, that's no longer possible. Um, so the grant had expired. Uh, we can apply for, again, an extension. Uh, it's been through the review process, uh, and we got notification that we were denied. But we have an opportunity to apply for another type of grant that would do the work? Or uh, we, we could apply for another grant if one existed. Um, currently, we're um, utilizing Medicaid funds and working with New Oakland on a payment mechanism. Um, the state, when they do come out with the final rules, will have a funding mechanism in place, which we can utilize at that point. I, with the emphasis on mental and emotional health, I, I guess that's what I'm trying to This This was such a success for us, and I'm just wondering... Um, how much more we others may be able to help promote that to see if we can get this additional grant or get it regranted or something? I don't know. I, yeah, we're, um, hopefully the state will come out with their final rules very soon. It's within, the, within, I think they're aiming for fiscal year 25. So at least until that, at that point, we'd be able to get money from the state this, to fund this stuff. If, if I could follow back up, it's related to what Pastor Jones was saying. So, um, so we are there. There will be some other mechanism in place um, to fund this. Then, correct? Uh, correct. Okay. And right now, we're relying on the state to find out what their funding mechanism would be, which could potentially be beneficial to us. Correct. But right now, this grant has expired, and there is no other grant that's out there that we could apply for. Correct. But you're billing Medicaid at this point. Yeah, hi. Kim Flowers, uh, Chief Clinical Officer. So, yes, we are, you know, uh, we did very well with that grant. We did a lot of good work, and we're still doing it. So we don't imagine that we're going to not do it. It's a service that's very well needed and very well received in the community. So as far as seeking another grant, yes. We're thankful for some folks that we have uh, here at OCHN who help us keep an eye out for grants for children's services or any such crisis services. And if that should come available, you better bet your bottom dollar. We're going to be seeking it to support this and maybe even to expand it. Because what um, you know, my uh, friend here, my colleague, uh, Dr. Glasgow said or didn't say is that the state is really looking at these crisis services uh, for adults right now. Um, uh, crisis stabilization units. We're not allowed to call the Youth and Family Crisis Care Center such a name because there's not been a licensure and all of the requirements put forth for such the licensure. But the state is working uh, on the adult version of this right now. Common Ground is a pilot for that uh, program working with us, you know, to be sure that we can um, meet that measure when it comes out. They're looking at the children's services to start um, they're, they're discussing what children's crisis stabilization may look like. Um, and so while we're listening to what they're saying for um, adult services, we're also listening for what they're saying for our children's services. And uh, so there may need to be some mm, expansion on how we provide that and maybe even some build out later. I hesitate to say that. Um, but so some of the requirements are going to be a little bit more expansive than what we read in the beginning for that the information that, what, that was available to us when we put this together. Um, I think we're ahead of what the state was doing, and so I think that's a big plus. But also as they become um, more mm, sure of how they want to see this um, type of service being um, provided, I think that we may be in line for some changes later on down the line. So grant funding will be very important. How they decide that this is going to be funded or how they allow services um, or facilities such as this to expand to meet new requirements, that's still on the table too. So there are a lot of things that are being discussed right now. But it's a good program and we're excited about it. So is that one of the reasons why you're uh, seeking accreditation? Yeah, well, yeah, we have been, uh, well, so I'm always wanting to tell you exactly what I'm thinking. So the um, we're looking at a couple of different things. Um, I'll say yes to your question. 
Well, and I'll leave it there before I go into a whole bunch of things that I maybe not be able to give you well, more answers. Well, accreditation for. will open you up to other insurance. It will, and other absolutely. Types of funding. Well, and so now um, we don't turn anybody away. Okay. So if anybody comes in, uh, we have a mechanism, and New Oakland has a mechanism to service anyone who comes and seeks service. So if you don't have Medicaid, I mean, at the front door, we're going to look at all these things while providing service, but we do have a mechanism to be able to. Um, to build commercial insurance if need be, and, uh, yeah. I did have one additional question. Sure. Uh, what was the current recidivism rate for the person served? How many times did you see the same consumer? Mm. So are you speaking adult or children? Uh, for the children's unit. Okay, either one. I don't have our numbers in front of me. Okay. But I still want to know what I need to bring back to you. Yeah, Kyle, do you? Uh, so, again, it hasn't been operating for a year, so we can't get a really solid number on that. Okay. I will say on the children's care unit, um, we would look at recidivism uh, for the crisis walk-in services. Mm -hmm. Recidivism becomes less of an issue because you actually want them to keep coming to you instead of EDs. Right. But the, the care unit is another story that we, we would want to keep an eye on that. And if uh, a child needs extra support and services, we would coordinate that more heavily at the discharge. Okay. And I noticed that you talked about if they were already involved in services, you would coordinate with that provider. So is that done within 24 hours, 48 hours? Because 72 hours goes by quickly. Uh, it does once they enter the screening unit. Mm -hmm. um, if the person is connected to a provider, it begins at that point. Okay. And then it will continue throughout their stay. Gotcha. Okay. Ms. Newman. I remember my other question. Um, when the uh, crisis center was being put together, we had an opportunity to tour before uh, work started and then after work was finished. We can't do that with the children's unit, but is there any way a tour could be uh, provided to the board? Uh, we do do tours. Um, it, they, it's based on kind of what's going on the unit at the time. So if there are kids on the unit, uh, and they're, sometimes they're in activities so that we can go in real quickly and turn right around and come back out, um, but sometimes they're not, and so we can't go in. So it's kind of a hit or miss. The lower floor is the same way. It's kind of a hit or miss. If there's a family there, uh, we don't have people go in, but there are times when it's empty. There are times, so is that is the possibility that the board would get a chance to? Yes. To okay, thank you, Dr. Hans. <clears throat> so um, yeah, this, this is a very very needed effort, and I, I'm also very grateful that this is available. I just want to know what kind of staffing is there for these. Children beds. So it would depend on the lower floor. There's always going to be at least one master's level clinician in order to screen them. Then they have one or two behavior techs. Uh, there's a receptionist. There's a security guard that's there that's not connected with New Oakland. Um, I think that's it for the lower floor. The upper floor, I'm just kind of going on memory here, but it's going to be a nurse. It's going to be a master's level clinician. It's going to be at least one behavior tech. Uh, and then psychiatry will come on as, as needed, essentially. Um, when the state rules come out, they'll be much more firm on how many people and of what discipline need to be there. Any additional questions? Uh, Dr. Giles? Hello. I just want to echo the thank you for the services. Um, and I just wanted to clarify with the staffing, is the psychiatrist on site? Is it a psychiatrist or is it a nurse practitioner or physician assistant? Uh, yeah, it is a psychiatrist. They're not stationed there on site. They will, they will come as needed. So I, I think he's usually there like once a day. Okay. Um, in the new rules, they will allow a nurse practitioner to be there. And well, they're discussing about what that might look like at this point. I will finish by saying, of course, the goal is to um, provide the most appropriate level of service, identify what the need is, and then hopefully if uh, some of those interventions can be 
managed on that unit, then you don't have to go to a hospital. Um, and so that's the whole point. So yes, the psychiatrist sees them every day. The clinician sees them every day. They have therapy every day. Parents are involved every day. All those things happen daily in hopes to um, uh, decrease the symptoms, maybe if it's medication management that can happen or a change, or sometimes a separation of the parents and the, and the child for a little bit of time can bring and de-escalate some of those situations and then have a parent-family conversation therapy group or however to do that. And I think we're doing it very well. If I remember, um, of those children that go to the unit, do you remember the percentage that... Uh, about 3% actually end up in the hospital. Okay. So we're doing very good um, that way with all of those pieces of uh, supports and services right there. I will put a plug in. We do need peer. <laughs> we need parent navigators um, to support that because that's very important to help our parents to, um, um, to engage and then also to work with them as they go back to the community and support that collaboration with the provider and that kind of thing and give our parents the support they need as well. Thank you, Kyle. No further questions? Thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, we'll move on to other business. Item 4, for a events and outreach. Good evening, Suzanne Weiner, um, Director of Communications and Community Outreach here at OCHN. Uh, just to give you a few updates of some of our community outreach this month. Um, the justice team has obviously a meeting and they did a presentation last week at the Board of Commissioners to the Health and Safety Committee. Uh, very well received presentation from the commissioners in attendance. Uh, we also have a few conferences this month as well as a VETS event that our veterans navigators participated in and also presented at. Next slide. Uh, additionally, tomorrow we're going to be hosting our, um, it's called a all-provider meeting, but it's really a breakfast or an appreciation for our providers. We'll be hosting that once a year. Um, we're moving forward with a new provider meeting plan where we're meeting with them quarterly and trying to keep it very consistent with all of our meetings so that they're on um, the same schedule on a quarterly basis. Also, you mentioned a tour of the Youth and Family Care Connect um, that Cal just presented on, and we actually do have a tour coming up for the Oakland County Board of Commissioners this month, so I'd be happy to coordinate with Sheila to try to get a tour set up for the board if, for anybody who would like to attend. Next slide, please. Um, also, just to highlight some of the press releases that uh, have already gone out this month and a couple that are still uh, Actually, one more that will be going out, our vet Veterans Observance obviously went out earlier this month. Um, also, we did a partnership with the Oakland County Health Division where we provided um, some surplus of COVID testing that we had to them so that they could distribute it in their clinics. Uh, as well as I am happy to note that Trisha Zizumbo, she is our Justice and Training Director, and she was honored by Cranes as a, a notable leader in DEI, so we're very proud of that recognition for her. As well as OCHN was designated as a top workplace, I believe I reported on this a couple of months ago, um, but we will be, we, we can now release that information on the 19th, so we'll be putting a press release out that week. I also wanted to mention we'll be hosting the Common Ground Survivor of Suicide event here this Saturday. So we're always looking forward to host um, events from our community partners. I also wanted to give you an update on our redetermination efforts. As you know, we've uh, continued to put out the letters to individuals who are re-enrolling. We continue to put messages out on our social media. We keep our website as up-to-date as possible. Um, we also are going to be sending out a postcard this month to a variety of contacts that we have. We purchased a list from our printer to get this postcard out to a variety of individuals in different communities throughout Oakland County. We've also made some contact with our health plans and um, the Medicaid health plans 
And we found that most of them do have a lot of information on their website uh, regarding redetermination, such as fact sheets, FAQs. Many of them are redirecting to MDHHS or the MyBridges account, or MyBridges um, resources. So many of them are relying on MDHHS as a resource. Um, they are also mailing letters, just as we are, um, to individuals who are set for re-enrollment or, or renewal. And then they're also doing phone calls and texts, um, as well as some other community outreach. They do have some staff that are dedicated to that community outreach as well. So we're finding that, um, obviously, social media is in, 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 in addition. We're finding that some of the activities that they're doing mirror what OCHN is doing for our outreach efforts. But I also wanted to mention that I virtually attended the um, House Appropriations Subcommittee, um, the Health and Human Services Committee, a couple of weeks ago, and Priority Health was actually in attendance at that meeting, and they outlined some of their efforts um, to re-enroll individuals. And based on some of the information that they provided, their biggest challenge essentially is getting those individuals to who aren't following through with the process. When they're getting the letter, they're not following through with their packet. So they're devoting a lot of resources to that to try to get individuals to re-enroll. They've found that they have um, improved their process over time. Uh, over these past few months, they've improved their process and they've um, actually increased the number of individuals that are re-enrolling. So we get the sense that that's similar for other health plans um, is what Priority Health is experiencing. So OCHM will continue our efforts with ensuring that we're mailing the letters out to individuals as well as the postcards, other outreach type of efforts, and hosting the, the events that we continue to help individuals with their re-enrollment process. Are there any questions? Okay. Oh, sorry. I was just wondering, are we doing anything on TV? We we do have commercials on TV for our services, for OCHN services. We have um, have had a long-standing contract uh, with our um, television providers. Mm -hmm. uh, we are able to switch up our commercials to and, and put this information on there, so we can definitely look into that. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Go ahead. One question. Uh, did Priority Health state how much advance time they're giving people? Let me look at my notes just to see if there was anything. The one thing that they did state is um, they are able to get people back onto coverage because of that 90-day retroactive. So that has been very helpful for them mm -hmm. to be able to, I mean, I know they stated that they have a 69% re-enrollment right now, right now, which is not bad, but there's, they mentioned that 31% of those who have lost coverage, that because of that 90-day retro reimbursement, they're getting about 16% of them back. So they are improving their their numbers in that way. Um, so I think that you know we're we're doing it when when the person's renewing the next month. We're giving them we're making sure they're getting their letter a month prior. But okay. they also have that 90 day retro re enrollment period as well. So that's that's helping them and helping the individuals we serve as well. So it's really more like 120 days. Yeah, I guess if you yeah. think about okay. it that way. It actually goes out. So um, the priority health is predominantly west side, though. So Meridian and Molina, who are predominantly southeast Michigan, I think we need to know where they're at. I mean, no offense to priority health, but they're Grand Rapids-based, West Michigan, North Michigan. And in all honesty, when you look at the numbers, they're smaller than like the Meridian and the, the Molina. Um, I did find some information about Meridian, um, mainly on their website. We did reach out to them, waiting for a response back to get some more information from them. Um, Molina, it was a little less information. They, we weren't um, able to get as much information from them, but they, they don't have as much information on their website either or even on their call line. I think it's, it's boots on the ground now. People need help filling these out. I think you guys and ARC and others have done a good job. The, the general information is out there. But, you know, you get this and then it's been three or four years since somebody's done it that 
it's not awareness, it, it's hands-on. So I think we need to stay on the providers that are big in our area. And the priority is small for Medicaid. Um, on the tour, what time is that? It, would, it feels like we should be touring with the commissioners rather than two separate tours. Is possible? What time? It's on the 20th, but what time? I'm going to defer to Kyle. Yeah, I know, but it's just they're going to tour, and then a month later we're going to tour, and I would just. Or what? Yeah, just deferring to Kim really quickly right now. I think Suzanne, we do already have to, a large. Suzanne, do you want me oh, to address that? that? Go ahead, Christine. Thanks. Oh, yeah. So when we were designing the tours, obviously because the YFCC is a service environment, we were trying to keep smaller groups in numbers of tours. Um, so the BO, we actually were going to set one up for the BOC separately one for our Lansing legislators separately so that we don't have large numbers of people walking through the RCC at one time out of respect for the individuals uh, in the facility. So you're going to be touring when there's patients? Okay, all right. I was just in that building for a housing commission meeting, so it, it didn't uh, feel like there was a lot of sheltering of people when we were ushered in, so anyway. We'll defer to you guys. Other questions from board members? Um, John, not a question. Well, uh, uh, let me just do what I said to um, Edna White about the um, workplace recognition, and it, it's here. So thank you all very, very much. Boy, y'all did that very quick. Uh, I want to congratulate um, the Human Services Group, Resource Group, for the job that they've done, and certainly the recognition. And then, and then the other, uh, and I got the note today about uh, November being National Family Caregiver Month, and um, thank you for, for notifying us about this, because right now, that's, that's a very big area in relation to um, mental health issues for persons who are caregivers of their families, husbands, wives, what have you, uh, and the level of stress that they're going through, anxieties and frustrations. So uh, to the extent that we can really bring that to light, uh, it's very, very important. So thank you all for recognizing that and, and for even identifying that OCHN is a major part of that providing services and uh, concern. Okay? Thank you. If you are online and wish to speak for the second opportunity for public comment, please raise your hand. And I know Adam has one there now. We kind of skipped over the Tri County meeting slide. It came right after, and she was not here. It was back before public comment. Right there. I didn't see it on the agenda. <laughs> okay. All right. Just want to make sure we didn't miss it. Everybody RSVP too. Maybe that would help Sheila too. So we would what know. It seems really like we've gotten out of the habit of actually clicking that electronic RSVP. All right, Adam. Yep, I just want to thank Edna and her team and Kyle and her, um, his team for the presentation tonight. They were very informative. Thank you. All right, thank you. Any other comments? 
It's not. Uh, oh, I, you know, and this may be off subject, but um, this group brought uh, to my attention, I guess, from the Action Network, and it dealt with Narcan mm -hmm. uh, and the the benefits of it. Uh, and I tell you, uh, we installed a unit uh, there at the church and talked about it with other persons. And, and I have a list today of, of close to 15 or 20 churches that said, hey, we need to do this, because what it does, it, it, it can prevent death, as you all know, prevent death if the Narcan is, uh, application is applied quickly or there. And whether it's a person that uh, have a drug issue or whether it's someone who overtaken their medication, uh, it's certainly a benefit, and I wanted to highlight that because, you know, this group brought this to, to us, or to me, uh, and now, you know, some 20 churches have signed up and said, hey, we want to do it. And the idea now is to say, how do we stretch it out throughout the faith community? How do we face this throughout the faith community? And so if anybody has contacts or said, hey, boy, I'd like to find out more about it, please let us know. Really something. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Any other comments? If not, we stand adjourned. Thank you. We're getting too deep in operations.